Hey, so I'm here to talk about RSD. There's some information out there and I don't love a lot of it. And part of me wanted to make this big video where I did all this research on rejection sensitivity, dysphoria and ADHD and presented it in a way that was all organized and stuff. And it turns out that I have enough of my own that that was never gonna happen. But what does happen an awful lot is I'll start a phone call with somebody, usually for a consultation about ADHD coaching, and I'll often give people a little precursor on it and just word vomit out. So I figured I could do that live and not overthink the thing to death. So I just decided to do that. I have a few notes, but mostly this is just me winging it end up a little bit too late. <laughs> sort of had to bully myself into doing it all day long. So what is rejection sensitivity dysphoria? The way I'm talking about it at the very least, it is a symptom of ADHD and it's not one that gets a lot of attention. It's not running around chasing squirrels or daydreaming. It's feelings and it's that thing if you have ADHD where somebody gives you feedback and it's totally good valuable feedback and you realize it hurts your feelings just like a little bit more than maybe it seems is normal in the situation. It's that thing. And, and like a lot of ADHD symptoms, it's not something that regular people don't experience all the time. It's just that little bit more. You know, everyone loses their keys a couple times. It's a matter of degree. So rejection sensitivity, the way I view it, and this is not a common way to view it, it's a lot of these elevated feels things. It can be actual fear of rejection. You know, I'm afraid that this social group will reject me and so I'm going to not uh, engage with them. It comes up a lot in times when we're looking for a job or filling out college applications and that is literal rejection fear, right? <laughs> It's so hard to put yourself out there like that. It can look like a lot of different things. It can be just that we do a little bit of extra negative self-talk. That thing where you sort of tell yourself you're not any good or you, why can't I just blank? It can be a little bit of that too. It's sort of this overly negative interpretation, usually about ourselves or our perceptions of how other people view us. Sometimes it's just that extra imposter syndrome or feeding into perfectionism. I really have to get this just right, so blank. Again, why I'm doing this as a live stream and not a really fancy published video. Sometimes we'll feel like, oh, I need to do all this extra research before I start a thing. And that's one of the many ways that it can actually play into procrastination and other more commonly talked about ADHD symptoms. It can also be super hard to ask for help. We can be extra sensitive to that feeling like we're bothering somebody. Even though I know it's a totally normal thing in the business world that some of people are busy and they don't respond to your email the first time and it doesn't mean they hate the thing that you proposed. Oh my gosh, is it hard to send that second email? It is really, really, really hard to send that second email. It was hard to send the first one, but if I need to send a follow-up one and I don't already have a template ready to go that's, ah, I may just not send it. Oh, by the way, if you are in the wonderful ADHD position of having people to delegate to, sometimes it can actually make that part difficult too, even though there's somebody, hey person, you could do these things that are not a good fit for my brain. Sometimes it can be still hard to do that extra delegation. <laughs> it can also be really hard to take notice of the things we have done successfully. It turns out we have done things successfully, but we have such a focus on all the things we haven't done or that we worry we haven't done correctly, that it can be hard to focus on those and, and to remain positive. This can look a little bit different in teens than when you're just talking about yourself. In a teen, what this can look like is, oh my gosh, all I asked you to do was pick up your towels. Why are you yelling at me and leaving the room? Okay, maybe you only asked them to pick up the towels, but what you didn't know is all day long, your teen with ADHD has had this negative self-talk going on, potentially. So all day long, there's you know this voice saying, you should have done this thing, you should have done this thing, and maybe it's homework they haven't done, or overthinking the, the social encounters that they had with their peers. 
with this negative voice all day long, your voice is just the only one that it's not going to make them feel crazy to yell back at. <laughs> and and so you're going to get the brunt of it as, as the parent. And that could be, oh, oh, my kid doesn't care about doing their homework. Well, usually when you really break it down, they kind of care about things like moving up to the next grade level <laughs> with their peers. But that doesn't always translate into action. And, and those hidden assignments, usually in our heads, they've grown huge compared to what they actually require us to do to finish them. And they've just become this very negative, mean thing in anyone, not just teens. One of the ways that the RSD can work with procrastination is if we have something old and, and it already feels old. And feeling old may not mean it's actually overdue yet. It might just mean I told myself I was already going to start that, therefore in my head it is overdue and what is wrong with you, you terrible person. Not true, but that's what that's doing. And sometimes I'll work with a client and, and I can see over our little Zoom, like what's that pile of papers? That pile of papers looks like it's yelling at you. And something about it draws my eye. And more often than not, they'll be like, yeah. I was like, that looks like a pile of stress. And, and what I can see in there is it contains these projects that they meant to do. Didn't want to put them in the filing cabinet because I have to remember to do it. But every time we're reminded of something to do at the wrong time, what that actually does is make it less likely for us to do the thing, not more likely to do the thing, because now we have this old guilt. So the older the things get, and again, like, it doesn't have to be a due date. It could just be I had decided I was going to clean my garage and I keep not cleaning my garage and so I'm still feeling bad about it. The harder it is to interface with them, and I really do believe this feeds back into the rejection sensitivity, we can get to the point where the thing, every time I think about doing the thing, whatever the thing is, there's also this dialogue that goes with it. And the dialogue could be like, why can't you ever just do the things? And, and in it, it could be attached to all these other things I remember that I should have done that I feel bad about. And so I'm just gonna shut the whole thing down. Why would I wanna interface with something that's just gonna yell at me the second I open it? One of the ways you can tackle it is with a buddy. So what you do is you would sit down and actually look at it and read it over with somebody else there. It's, it's like a virtual hand holding. And it could become a little bit less painful and a little bit easier to engage with some of that really old garbage. What are some of the ways we can tackle RSD? We can tackle it with groups. Uh, it's one of the reasons that ADHD support groups or guilds like mine can be really helpful is you're hearing other people's stories too. And that can reduce the amount of it's just me that feeds into that negative self-talk pattern. Another way you can do things is focusing on wins. Maybe said ADHD group slash guild, maybe they're doing that too. But it's where you actually stop and recognize I have done stuff well and I have done stuff period. And that can start to refocus back onto the more positive things that we have actually done. Some people use a to-did list. So instead of what you need to do, there are things you already did. Just to keep perspective that we are doing things and we are moving forward. Mindfulness training sounds a little white nonsense sometimes, but that can be one of those things that can help reduce the intensity of negative emotions including rejection sensitivity. Another one is alpha-2 agonists. This is a class of medications. Guanfacine and clonidine are in that group. And if they work for you, they can be life-changing. They can shift the focus from, oh my gosh, everything is my fault, to being able to view the world as a little bit more of a balanced place like it really is. And it can lessen rejection sensitivity a lot. Uh, some of the other benefits, and of course, not every drug works for every person, can be increased cognitive flexibility. So that thing where you hyper-focus a lot and it can get worse on stimulants for some people. Bringing something in like guanfacine or clonidine can bring it back into balance a little bit, pull out of those rabbit holes a little bit easier. You still have to, you know, want to and to get out of them. When they treat the rejection sensitivity, it can, it can change your perspective. Um, for me, it makes me a better listener too, which is part of the reason I fought so hard to get it covered because sometimes it's hard for insurance to cover it. But also, you know, it's my job as a solo printer to go out and tell people I can do a good job. If I'm sitting there having too many self-doubts, about, well, why did anybody want to listen to me about a video on rejection sensitivity? It might be hard to actually do that. And I have found, at least for me, that with these medications, it can help a ton. I went off them for a brief period at the start of the pandemic just because everyone put their lives on hold, so I wasn't taking them. And I noticed the difference. 
I mean, I was just chatting with my mom and she made some offhand comment. It was not intended to hurt my feelings. And I took it so personally. I kind of snapped at her and I felt really bad about it. Or I, I went to dinner with some family that I hadn't seen in a while. They were in my bubble, but um, I wasn't on the medications. And I noticed that, <laughs> that um, I, I was talking over people more and doing more interrupting than I had done in a while. It was really easy to think, oh, I thought that was all my mindfulness and, and good stuff. And I was like, no, it was the medications too. <laughs> Another way that we can protect ourselves is to sort of gird up our emotional loins on occasion. You know, maybe again, use the buddy system. But if we're asking for feedback or something, what do we need to do to like, you know, br brace for impact, for lack of a better word. And those are some of the things that we can do. But don't forget, like, connecting with other people, especially other people with ADHD, it can make a huge difference just in feeling less alone and having somebody to tackle some of that old painful tasks with. It makes a difference not to be alone. I feel like a lot of us have learned to appreciate that more recently. Thank you so much for watching this. If you did, it would have been awesome to put something together with all the science, but I, I just knew I'd never finish it. So here we are, some thoughts on rejection sensitivity. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. If I missed something, let me know, absolutely. And until then, I'll talk to you later.